Hi everyone. Today we have Ryan Johnson. He's going to tell you the story of what happened to him while he was surfing. And he's been surfing since he was six years old. He had an incident in Oxnard, California while he was surfing. Hi, Ryan, thanks for being here today. Can you tell us the story of what happened when you were surfing? Sure, I'd love to. Um, it was a beautiful day and uh, I just got done dropping a friend off at the supermarket who, had, who was injured and couldn't ride his bike. He lived on a boat. And so I gave him a ride to the supermarket. And as I stepped out of the car to help him into the market, I had this just everything was beautiful everything was like in high definition and it was enough it was it was so different that I actually said to myself in a quiet voice I said today seemed like a miraculous day and uh, as I walked into the market with him everybody coming in and out of the market I I, I recognized and I I kind of knew just from uh, from the area where I live and it just it caught my attention that there's something special about that day. Um, so after dropping them off, I went home, I grabbed my board, the sun was shining, um, there, was, there wasn't a drop of wind, it was just the perfect day. So I pulled into the parking lot, didn't even check the waves, just got suited up and uh, paddled out. It was about head high and um, sheet glass i made it out to the lineup and caught a few waves and on my last wave um i kicked out i went left i rode the wave for a while and then i kicked out of the wave which means you exit the wave and i got back on my board and started paddling towards the lineup where everybody sits to line up and catch waves um the takeoff spot and i got about halfway out and i took a a look at everybody in the lineup and it looked pretty crowded so i decided to myself or had the idea to go in to paddle in and go do stuff at home and as i sat as i was in sitting on my board i turned around to my right and lay to lay prone position to start paddling and i remember taking using my left arm to take my first paddle and everything else just blacked out and uh, the next thing I know I woke up in the ICU with a team of doctors and nurses I was in a full body brace completely intubated um, restrained to the to the bed um, a lot of machines a lot of stuff going on and that's uh, what I remember in the physical world um, and I had quite an experience uh, while I was dead. So I, what happened was, I'll give you the background story in the, in the physical plane, um, is something happened that triggered me to go face first into the water. I drowned, I had lost con consciousness. So I automatically drowned, um, which led to pretty much death. Uh, my heart stopped bleeding or start, stopped beating. Um, brain stopped working, stopped breathing, and I slowly drifted out along the jetty, out past the, the lineup of the crowd of surfers, and out to the end of the jetty um, to where the boats enter the harbor. And two kids were out in the lineup, and they're paddling around looking for waves. And what you usually do is you, you look for for swells for waves coming in and they come in groups so you're constantly looking out at the horizon for incoming waves and one of these boys happened to be doing that on his longboard he went up over a wave and he looked up looked got up high as he could to look as far out to see as he could to see if he could see any waves and he saw me floating face down um, with my board trailing behind me and so um at first he thought nothing of it he thought maybe i was just looking at something underwater uh, which is kind of weird since our since the water quality is has no uh, clarity to it whatsoever so it, it he paddled around some more he got up on his board to check to see if any more waves were coming and he saw that i was in the same position and nothing had changed he was seemed alarmed 
and he got his best friend to paddle out to me. And they first, they yelled at me, no response. Then they started kind of prodding at me and there was no response. And then finally one of them grabbed my hair at the time, lifted my face out of the water and saw that water was pouring out of my mouth. My eyes were kind of rolled back and non-responsive and my skin was completely purple and blue um, and uh, I had no heartbeat. So they started yelling um, to the guys that were in the lineup for help and a few guys paddled out and it was, they had a difficult time trying to get, I guess, a dead body, a way, you know, back to shore. Um, so they tried a few various ways, it took a little while. And finally they managed to get me back closer to shore where there was the undertow and it was hard for them to get me up on shore. And this is when uh, people took notice on the beach and a few people called 911 and a couple, that were down the beach took notice, the wife took notice actually. And her husband was an off-duty lifeguard paramedic, which was a miracle. And she said, babe, I think there's you know a problem. And he took a look and he's like, no, there's some kids playing on the water. And she said, no, there's, there's an issue. And so he looked again and he said, oh yeah, definitely. And he ran down and he jumped in the water and he helped pull me out. And he pulled me up on the beach and at first, uh, I guess, first sight, he, he assessed me and he thought that I'd been kind of dead in the water too long um, to, to try to revive me. It, it would cause more problems than just letting me be. And so he left to go meet the first responders in the parking lot to, to kind of inform them of what happened. And uh, as he was walking away, he had an intuitive kind of thought and it was to go back and to start uh, to go back and go through the motions so he came back he walked back to me he got down on his knees and he started CPR for about five minutes till he noticed my skin lightening and uh, he uh, he got a pulse um, and right as he had he got a pulse back um, the first responders arrived. Um, and another miracle was that the chief of the fire station that got the 911 call had two teams out that day. One was fully dressed and ready coming from another incident. And the other team was on uh, physical, do uh, they're doing you know, physical activities, but they're much closer, but they weren't ready. So he sent the he sent the team that was closer but they you know they weren't suited up there and they're like jogging gear and on that team one of the team members was a navy or was a navy reservist uh um medic and he had just got back the night before before he had to report to duty at the fire station and he was in virginia for six weeks doing a course for this exact scenario for the navy seals and he was the first one on the scene besides you know my actually the paramedic that that was on the beach that did the cpr um a lot of miracles a lot of a lot of weird stuff the guy the, the lifeguard um he that first helped me he used to be a good friend of mine um he was a roommate with one of my best friends that lived in oxnard and he knew me from way back when, when I was on the beach and he kind of recognized me. Um, years have passed, but he, he couldn't figure it out. Anyways, the first responder insisted on taking over since he had just got back from that training. They put me in uh, an ambulance. He insisted on going with me. Um, a few more guys went with me because even though my heart was uh, beating, I still couldn't breathe, I was still drowning. And so I, I was just, I was losing it physically. I was just kind of alive and drowning at the same time. So it took quite a few people to hold me down in the ambulance ride. And they sent me to uh, the closest trauma center, which is a good 15, 
at least 15 minute drive. Um, and uh, they checked me in and they did whatever they did in the ICU. I have no memory of it. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then three about three hours, four hours later, I woke up in the ICU. Um, now, the near-death experience part of it was an incredible experience. Um, I, I, you know, at some point it, during the drowning, um, I, I, I left my body and uh, I went into a beautiful, peaceful place that, that were just, it was full of colors and I ceased to exist. I, it wasn't something that I was conscious of in the way that we're conscious here on earth, um, where, we're, where we're processing, where there's the I and it's the I is processing the world or events that are happening to me. It was just, I just melted into it uh, and there was no I, it was like the, the I became the everything. And the first place that I went to was just this completely white expanse of infinity that was that had hues of beautiful colors um, that, that were changing like a, like a sunset. Um, and then from there, uh, I went, I felt like I was led or, or I was helped or whatever. I, I went to a place that I felt like I was being judged, um, like to, but it wasn't like a courtroom. It didn't, uh, it didn't feel like that. It didn't, it didn't feel like that emotionally. Um, it was just peace and love, but whatever, but I was aware of something that was looking deep into my heart, like not of the, not of, not about actions and it wasn't about truth. It was about intentions and um, just a deeper vibration of, of what we emanate. And it just found, it just found love inside of me and it let me, I guess I passed through, through that through that scene or through that whatever it was um and remember that i was i was laying dead in the water so i had no eyes to see with no ears to hear with um i i had i had no senses physical senses so all of this was happening internally or in my soul um and it wasn't like i said i wasn't conscious of it um, as I am here on a day-to-day -day basis. It was just, everything was, it was just happening. I, I, it's hard to explain, um, but there wasn't a separation of me and what was happening. It was just, it was, I was just part of it all. It was like a drop of water returning to the ocean. Um, you know, you don't know if you're, you're the drop or the, you know, or the, in the ocean or the ocean is in the drop. Um, it, I guess it's a relative, but anyways, from there, I got this sense that I was about to meet something bigger than myself. Oh, I'm sorry, before, before this had the judgment part happened, I was shown the, uh, I was shown kind of the world and it was as if the world was split in half and, but everything was connected. Um, it looked like a circuit board, but, but with trees and with rocks and with people and with everything, but everything was connected and you could see its energy source. And we all came from the same energy source, but we all, we all, we all grow in the physical world as different forms, but still connected to the same flowing energy. And it kind of this whole thing was shown to me as I was traveling to the place of where like my heart was being examined or looked at. Um, and then after that, I, I, there was an awareness or something that came over me or that I, I started to feel. Um, 
and I don't, when I say I, I, I don't want to, you know, regress on the part that says that, or I'm saying that the, that, that the, the I was lost, um, but I was conscious of this greater feeling and I felt that I was going to like meet God um, or something of a higher power of some sort. And I remember this large white room and there were no boundaries, but it had, it had the, it had the feeling of a room. Um, and there was this table and it was, it was like a white table, but it, but then again, it really wasn't. It was just this energy that separated that you could, that you could feel the separation. And on the other side was, it, it looked, I mean, it, it was a, almost as if it was an image of me with long curly hair and glowing brightness and just white, like just this light pureness. Um, and uh, had, there's a lot of information that was transferred to me. And I wish I remembered a lot of it because it was just this deep knowledge. And again, I had no ears to hear and no eyes to see. So everything was just being transmuted um, uh, to me. Um, and, and from there, I was, I was guided. I had guides, which I remember. And they took me to like a land or a world or a garden of souls. And every, all, everybody was just doing their, it was like a park. It, it seemed like a park. And the, the people didn't have such fine features as they do here on earth. They just had auras to them and their auras, uh, their auras, um, they, 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 um, they, they express the, the people's features, and, but they but their energy, like you could tell people were different by their shades of energy. It's hard, a little hard to explain. Um, and then there were a few great people that uh, were waiting for me. Um, that kind of met me there. They were like greeters. And uh, they, they kind of had just this quiet wisdom about them. Um, I, I believe they were some very big souls that have been passed on this earth. Um, very wise and powerful people. And I don't mean power as in money, but I mean power as in like Gandhi and um, Lubavitcherebi and just just profound spiritual human beings. Um, and then from there, I I went to uh, another another garden, I guess you could say, of of souls. Um, and I was shown, I was walked through it, and um, I, it was like taking a stroll through a park that I wasn't quite used to <laughs> um, because it was filled with it was filled with souls and everyone seemed happy and everyone seemed in place and doing what they're supposed to be doing um, it wasn't as if people had free will to act out of character or to act with ill intention it seemed like people were totally at peace where they were just grazing like cows they were there there there's just a uh, a level of peace with with every individual that was noticeable um there wasn't like a lacking or a wanting or a needing or people running around trying to fulfill something it was just they were just gracefully grazing through this like garden and then uh and then at some point i got like i felt or the best way to describe this was um i felt like i got a ticket and I was being walked to like, an, I guess the front of an amusement park. Um, it seemed like it had a gate and like a booth and stuff. And they take your ticket and they let you through the gate. And uh, the way I think about it now is that that was kind of my entrance to the next world. And uh, 
I, I had permission to enter into it. Um, but at that moment was the first moment that my conscious kicked in, like my, my ego, myself, uh, like there was a spark of it in my mind where I remembered who, who I, who I was, where I came from and those that I loved. Um, and I remember turning around as quick as I could and like letting the ticket go and running, running back from the gate in the opposite direction as fast as I could. And from there I went through this like time warp, um, like you see kind of on the movies, like with the tube and everything's flashing. And, and that's when I popped up and opened my eyes in the ICU. And I looked around and just saw everybody and everything. I was completely calm and I've never been at peace like how I was, especially waking up to all that chaos that was around me. I just was, I, I've never been so much at peace. Um, and I, it took me a little while to, to kind of realize where where I was, what what's happening, what's happened. Um, I I was I couldn't move. I was confined, and on the board it said John Doe. Um, they didn't know who I was because when they found me, I was just in a wetsuit. They had to take off of me. I had no identification, um, so they didn't they didn't know anything about me. Um, so I so I just kept moving my hand. To, for somebody to pick up that they wanted a pen and a paper and this nurse finally got it and so I I wrote down you know uh my wife's phone number my parents phone number and they realized I was trying to communicate um through that and probably 10 minutes after that my my parents and my wife had walked into the room and that was because the the fire chief had said this guy's got to have a family like I can't let this go he's like he told his team he's like at dark we're going to go back to the parking lot when they close the gates and hopefully his car will be the only car there we'll run the license plate and we'll trace him down so he followed his plan but when he got to the parking lot there were like five cars in the parking lot so it wasn't very easy for him to pick out my car so they broke into the first car and it wasn't the right car. And the second car, they saw the windows down. They saw my mom's dog that I was uh, dog sitting that day. The windows are cut. The dog was safe. It was, it was cool enough for all the pet lovers out there. Um, and the passenger seat was down because that's where you put the surfboard in. And so the fire chief was like, this is the car. Um, he broke into it. They got the registration whatnot and this was another miracle like this was the only car that was registered for between my wife and I so they were able to connect my wife and my house and everything to due to the res, uh, registration so they sent a sheriff um, to my house and waited for my wife to get home she was running late and they said your husband's been in a surfing accident um, doesn't seem like he's going to make it um, and that's it. Showed up at the hospital right around the same time as I was waking up and giving that information. And there's a lot of there's a lot of other things that that kind of transpired um, in, in in the the NDE world um, that that are hard to put into put into words on Earth because we. Yeah, we, we don't experience them, but you could say that all the people that have passed, especially good people, even not so good people, that love or God is nothing but love. And um, everybody is a-okay and it's here on earth that we have a hard time um, processing this, but um, in the world that we travel to, um, those people are doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're safe and they're, they're being loved and fed and cared for. Um, and you could, 
I, I could tell that it's when I went through that judgment part that they, they weren't looking for any of my faults. Um, they weren't looking for anything like that. They were looking for all the goodness in my heart. And that's purely what it, it was. And uh, it was all, all, the, all the faults and bad things that I may have done were, were totally ignored. And um, so, so that's, uh, that's it. So questions or anything, please go ahead because I'm sure I missed a lot. But <laughs> And there's so much, so it's hard to compact it all into, so. I you know there's so much. Thank you for sharing your story, Ryan, because I know, I know it's not easy to tell these stories because you went somewhere that's inexplicable and in ineffable. It's not something that's easy to put into words. And I'm just going to do a quick share screen just to show that this was in the newspaper real quick. Here we go. No, no, no. It's right here. Hold on. Where is it? Um, oh. Why isn't the story there? I have the story there. Oh, no. Um, You're getting it live. <laughs> OK, never mind. OK, so um, yeah, I was trying to share your article, but somehow it's not there. I don't know why. Yeah, it, was, it said it was showing a green screen. But I, yeah, I don't know why. I had, it was so easy before I was able to have the article pop right up. So um, yeah, now I'm trying to. Um, Okay, so I'll just ask you a question. So the reason that I do this, by the way, so that mm -hmm. you know and other people know, we talked about it briefly, is um, I know that so many people, oh, there, I just, I just stopped the screen share. So many people, including myself, we have such a hard time on this earth. You know, there, there are people that you're gonna reach right now, Ryan, that have had loss and your story is gonna help them so much. And what I do as a hypnotherapist, I help people with their anxiety, depression, things like that. And it can manifest in so many ways. It could be weight loss, stop smoking. It could be fear of public speaking, test taking. Um, there's just so much. And so I, I started interviewing people because stories like yours, which I heard about years ago, this happened to you when, 2017? Uh, it was March, March 17th, 2017. Yeah, so. 3.33 3, 3, p.m. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we'll do a part two because I know you have a lot more to share, but I'll, yeah. I'll show the article next time because I, when I practiced this, I had the article pop up really quickly. I know, I don't know why it wasn't there, but um, so if anyone wants to reach me for help, it's growthfactor.org at gmail.com. And I, like I said, I help people with a lot, but, but stories like yours, I think help even more because, you know, even if someone hasn't had a severe loss in their life, uh, someone really close to them, just having a hard time financially or with family, with health, just stories like yours remind us that this is, but please correct me. I'd like you to summarize what I'm saying better because I haven't been where you've been. I haven't, I've had little spiritual stories that are not significant like yours, but I feel that stories like yours remind us that this is the world of test, like a school and where you went is a world of truth. Like you were saying that there was no judgment. People didn't have wants and needs. You couldn't even be bad if you wanted to. Um, maybe you can summarize that. And my other question is, you mentioned so many miracles with the captain and the team and the ambulance and the surfers happening to be there and the registration with your car. There were so many miracles. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just summarize this earth and the next place. And then also anything else with miracles after that? Anything you notice about yourself? Because I know people e either, they tend to be more sensitive about how people are thinking or feeling. And I'm going to mute myself to listen. Okay, so that's a lot. Um, answer the question about, I guess, the, the earth part. Um, one is that, well, one thing that resonates with me and I realize is that all of this, I didn't go anywhere. My body was floating in an ocean, dead. So all of this took place inside of me. Now, if my body is dead, Okay, my blood's not pulsing, my brain's not working, I'm not breathing. The, the, the truth about that is that we have a soul. Okay, so anyone in doubt if they have a soul or not, or if there is a, a bigger picture, if there's a higher power or God or however you want to define 
something larger than ourselves that created this amazing world. Um, it's that's something to me that is proof right there is because I had that experience and I had no senses working. Um, so that means that something inside of me was transferred to somewhere else and experienced all of that. Um, now, this world, I would almost compare more to, to I, I don't wanna use the word, like uh, th this is a world where it, everything could be like in a way, like all, all the people that we, we've lost can come back, like can manifest back in this world. Like all these things could come back in this world. It's, it's here that we need to, or we should, I can't say need because there's a lot of things that I need to work on, but we should be working on those things here. Um, kindness, love, th those are the most important things. Um, honesty, truth, and that's not just with somebody else, that's with yourself. That's, I mean, that's what it boils down to is really is how honest and, and clear you are with yourself. And it's a struggle. I've had a lot of struggles um, before the accident and, and after the accident, because it was such an intense thing that I, I, I haven't really worked through till today. I mean, you've been trying to get me to do this for years and I've, you know, I have come up with every, every excuse in the book not to do it. Some of them were, some of them were legit. Yes. <laughs> um, but I, it, it, I haven't processed it. I'm just beginning to process it. Um, it's so heavy. And I went from such a high, like I, when I first, when they took the, in, the intubator out of me in the hospital, I could barely speak, but I had so much wisdom and knowledge. I was trying to depart like to anyone that would listen. And everybody was just, their, their ears were closed. They're just like, you're alive. You know, like they didn't know if I could walk yet or, you know, or if I had all my functions, it was too early. But, you know, they were just more amazed that I was alive because it's unheard of. They say like five minutes is like the max you could go. It was way longer than five minutes. I mean, way, way, way longer um, into the impossible. And any medical doctor would say that that's impossible. But, I'm, you know, I'm here to prove that. So I don't. And so I went to the, from this high. Um, nobody wanted to hear what I had to say because they were just, you know, happy I was alive, but, it, and, uh, you know, I, I've forgotten a lot of, a lot of what was departed, or what was given, um, except the main thing, which is, is love and kindness, and, and beauty and respect to people, and then I went down to a very, a very depressed place as well, because I, 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 if they get, if I was told my purpose, I forgot it, and I didn't know why, so many good people have passed and I was brought back because I, you know, I'm, I don't think I've done anything heinous in my life, but I haven't been a perfect person. Um, I haven't been a horrible person, but I haven't been a perfect one. And if anyone should get a second chance, you know, I, I, I probably wouldn't put myself on the list. Um, so it, been very, you know, I got very depressed because it was like, why, why me? Why am I back here? Um, of course, you know, fam, family, stuff like that, but everybody has some family, family at some point, you know, whether, whether it's healthy relationship or a re relationship that could be worked on and healed and all these things. Um, so I'm going on a tangent from what your questions were, but um, so so it was just, it's been a lot of, a lot of depression. It goes up and up and down. There's not a day I don't think about that accident. Um, you know, there's a lot of PTSD. I went from surfing since I was five years old and absolutely loving surfing and being in the ocean and trying, that was my place of healing and refuge when, you know, I had a pretty intense childhood. Um, parents got divorced and 
there's a lot of pain and anger in that that I was dragged into. And uh, I had no way of, no, nowhere to hide and no way to like, to, to heal myself. And when I was introduced to surfing and the ocean, I instantly fell in love with it because it, it, it was my place of refuge. And I did it as much as I could throughout my whole life and traveled all over the world to surf. And, and now I have such a fear of the ocean that it's not, not, not a, a fear in a bad way, but just I, it, it's, I'm, I'm more, more humble. Um, it's a humiliating, or hum, it's a humiliated, I guess, fear of the ocean in a way. It's a humbling experience. Um, so I, I haven't surfed as much as I should be, or I, I'd want to. Um, I just did get a new board, so my plan is to get back out there. But um, well, I, I'm sorry I went on tangents, but I did have an oxygen injury due to this accident. So um, my whole life has changed. Like I spent the last three or four years trying to to get back to who I thought I should be, who I was. And since that accident, that, that can't happen. I have changed as a person. I function differently. The doctors didn't even know what to do with me. Three days later, I was able to get up and go to the bathroom and speak with them. And, you know, and they were baffled. They're like, what do we do with this guy? And so they discharged me three days later. And uh, I wound up back in the hospital three days later with a bad case of pneumonia from the water in my lungs. But, um, um, you yeah, know, I just... Uh, it's been all ups and downs. So, it, uh, yeah. So, if you, if you re ask some of the questions you wanted answers to or insight to, it would be helpful because my memory isn't, you know, 100%. So. Everything you said is what we needed to hear. Everything you said makes sense. And, you know, I've, because of my past anxiety, I probably had it for about 18 months and I had some things that really helped me, but stories like yours really helped me too. And it's common, so I know a lot of stories like yours. I don't know how many, but at least a hundred, if not more. So everything you said is common. And I think we've spoken about this before. You haven't studied anything because you didn't want to know. You just want to have your own experience. You didn't want to read the books or read the stories. So I, um, I understand that. But everything you said is common. People usually don't want to come back here. When they come back, they're depressed and it can be pretty severe. Their relationships become more difficult because you went to a place where you can't explain it to your family and they don't understand why you're acting different. Um, and I know you only have, uh, you have only maybe a few more minutes because I know you have to go and get your daughter, but you answered all the questions. I guess my, my we should definitely do a part two because I know there's so much more and you're probably going to think a lot out after this interview about um, other parts and how it affected you. I guess my, my final question would be, once you returned, I know you were high for a while and I, I've heard that before, you're just, love everybody and life is great and then you crash because right. you're back in this difficult world and then we have to make money we have to get along with people it's not right. easy so i think my question is just during that high did you notice anything different about yourself did you know what people are thinking did these strange coincidences happen did sometimes electrical you know your computer will break your watch will break just what did you know different about yourself um i I, I don't I don't have too much recollection about like you know magnetic stuff or electrical stuff um happening as far as people um yeah I was I was in in a totally I was in tune with people um as far as like a, a really deep sense of knowing um beyond conversation um intuitively like being able to kind of see see through people to see you know who, who they really are when you peel away the skin and all the flesh and the physicalness of the world um i felt like that with the world in general and that's been the, the tough part is and part of the high part was that being able to see the material stripped away and now everything's just pure energy and, and love and abundance and everything. And um, 
the, hard, the, the difficult thing or what I know was that I was able to see that in everything um, and very, very in, in tune with it and very sensitive to it. And I think the, the more I had focused on that, the more difficult it came to, to cope with the physical world because I started knocking on wood and it wasn't, you know, it, it was wood and metal is metal and all the things that are here to, to be the form they're in are doing their job, even though we're all made of the same stuff and we, you know, we were energy flows through, through us all. Um, and yeah, I could go into long conversations about this and I have not looked at any NDE stuff because I, I wanted, I didn't want to hear other people's story I, because I didn't want to fabricate stuff that other people um, experienced. So I made, I, I never picked up a book, didn't hear a story. I, I refused, you know, to any, if anybody offered any kind of suggestions, I refused to look them up or whatever because um, I just wanted to have my experience until probably this point came along and once I kind of tell my story and I'll go back and look at writings and journals that I did you know that were a lot as soon after the accident um I'll get some more have some deeper insight and to share but um now I'll probably start looking into it just to um just have a better understanding it might it might help me as well and I hope this helps other people with whatever they're struggling with you know, I've got a lot of struggles um, uh, pre-accident and, you know, post. And so it's, it's human. Humans are to, to thrive, you know, it's ups and downs and uh, it's how we, it's how we deal with them. And uh, I, you know, I wasn't disappointed coming back here. I wanted to, like, as soon as I had, that thought of my family and I and this world, as soon as I had just a, a spark of consciousness of of who, myself and where I came from, I couldn't run back fast enough. Whether I was scared to go beyond and you know to the next world, um, that could be, or I really wanted to come back and to repair the things that. I, maybe I left, I left in, in shambles and being here, I forget that every day. I forget to act with complete humility and kindness and of, of, of being a service and stuff to people because I take it for granted. It's hard in this material world to, to do that because you don't always see the spirituality, but, there, but this world is nothing but spiritual. Um, and if you grapple with with even that concept, um, whether you think, you know, this is just a physical world and when this is over, it's over. It's not, it's just beginning. And I, I don't like to say people die, but they just transfer. They're just, it's just like a bus station, you know, or a train station. It's just the one stop. And uh, it's, uh, we gotta make the most of it. And it's, it's hard to do sometimes to muster up that energy or that courage or, or be humble and say I'm sorry or, or whatever it is that you need to do at that moment to make that moment um, special and perfect and something that you won't regret. Because uh, one thing that I'm learning is that a life full of peace and not to have any regrets is probably even more peaceful than the experience I had um, when it's when it's our time to you know part from this world or transfer from this world is that if we really gave hum, you know, humbled ourselves to every experience to be present and give every 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 moment our true selves um, whatever that moment calls for whether it's a deep connection with the person or it's you're 
job at work, if you give it your all and that you're present. And um, that's what it boils down to is that's what honesty and truth is. Um, and that, that's our job as people. And uh, we could walk around this world as, 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 as animals do that don't have free will kind of, and they can, they're not able to talk or, you know, they're not able to construct Manhattan, and, you know, build jet planes or, you know, humans are able to do that. And that's what separates us from, you know, from what homo sapiens, I guess, would be, would be the word is that, you know, it separates us from the animal species is that a step above and we have abilities to do that and when we tap into our higher powers and we live a life of integrity and honesty and and we tap into our spiritual world here on earth we bring all of all the larger picture into the into our smaller frame that we can only see because this is only a glimpse i mean i can't even imagine how big the universe really is um and that, yeah, that's material thinking as well and that's you know that it's that, that's not even it that's that's just it's only we only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know and, uh, so yeah there's <laughs> there's a lot to talk about <laughs> I could write, write many books and many many of these on just the subjects and, and things that i've read not to do with NDE, but things that I've read that have been mind blowing that I probably wouldn't have understood prior to my accident. Um, I've always considered myself a spiritual person, but after the accident, I've had some proof and I've had I've had some experiences that have at least allowed me to um, think about some think about concepts and things I read in a different light and have a different understanding that I probably would have had access to prior to my accident, so. Thank you, Ryan. I look forward to us interviewing again, because I know you got to run right now to get your daughter, yeah. so. Thank you so know, much for I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> everyone for watching, and I'm really uh, looking forward to all the people that you're gonna help by listening. They'll be listening to your story and understand where the truth is, thank you. I hope so. I really do. It's all going to be good. It is all good. It's going to be good. And uh, the best thing you could do for yourself is, or that we could all do for ourselves is gratitude and humility. And, and that's it. And just be present. And that's all we could ask for. It's really all we could give. And uh, yeah. So until next time. Until next time. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.